We usually think of fried chicken as, well, traditionally an American dish. But today I'm going to share with you an old English recipe from 1736 that I think will change the way you make fried chicken. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. The recipe today comes from the little recipe book by Nathan Bailey called Dictionarium Domesticum from 1736. And it's an odd little cookbook. Uh, it's set up like a dictionary, so it's in alphabetical order. And this recipe you find under marinade. So that's where we need to start with this recipe, with the marinade. Now this one's actually pretty simple. Uh, it starts off with um, the liquid portion, which is lemon juice and verjus or vinegar. Verjus is a, actually a very common ingredient you'll find in early 18th century recipes. It comes from the juice of unriped grapes unfermented. And while it's very sour, it actually has a very mild flavor. If you're going to use vinegar, the vinegar that would have been typical uh, in an 18th century, especially English setting, would be malt vinegar. In the time period, they called it wine vinegar, but it's actually malt vinegar today. If you can't find that or you want to use something that doesn't quite have that kind of a flavor, then you can use cider vinegar or, or even distilled vinegar. Lemons were available as well, depending on your location and your social position. And interestingly enough, uh, lemon zest or lemon peel was the second most common uh, type of spice you'll find in many of the 18th century cookbooks. So very common. In this case, I'm opting for the juice of two large lemons and an equal amount of distilled vinegar. The recipe suggests salt, pepper, cloves, and bay leaf, but no real amounts here, except for the number of bay leaves, two bay leaves. So we're guessing um, maybe a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of black pepper, and a quarter of a teaspoon of cloves. And the last ingredient is something called chibles. And we had to look that one up. That's uh, spring onions, or as we would call it, green onions. I've got about a half a cup. Uh, shallots are something that you could substitute in in this place. Uh, shallots were very common in the 18th century, and it would probably uh, make a very interesting flavor addition. The recipe calls for quartering your chicken. I've actually cut it up into individual pieces so that it'll go a little farther. The recipe suggests marinating this chicken for three hours, and you should probably stick to that. If you use some of the more powerful, like the malt vinegar, it can really enhance the flavor too much. So three hours is a good time. We're coming up on our three hour mark and it's time to work on the batter portion. And this is a little bit different than what I'm used to. Like our marinade, the batter is also very easy to make. I'm using about a cup and a half of flour. Just regular all purpose flour will work fine. And enough white wine, like a Rhenish wine would be good. Uh, adding enough to make this into a thin pancake batter. And finally, I'm gonna add the yolks of three eggs. You can top this off with a little more wine if you need to, to get to the right batter consistency. And finally, a teaspoon of salt will finish this off and mix it so that it's nice and even. If you don't want to use wine, you could use cider instead or maybe just water. There was no suggestion of the particular kind of oil to fry in in the 18th century. Uh, they would have used a uh, lard, probably, or even a clarified butter. You can use the modern oil of your choice. We are deep frying uh, with oil right over an open fire. Obviously, you have to be very careful uh, when you're doing it like this. You want to heat your oil to about 350 degrees. You should see a little shimmer in the top, definitely not smoking.
We're gonna fry this in batches of three or four pieces, maybe five pieces. Really, it depends on the size of your pot. And I'm not sure exactly how long you wanna cook it, but you wanna to get to the point where the color is a nice light mahogany brown. Now before we serve this, there's just one more component that we need to do, fried parsley. Now you may think that's strange, but trust me, you'll love it. Before you fry this parsley, make sure it is very, very dry. Completely dry, blot it as much as possible, or the results can be disastrous. Fry it in small batches for several minutes until it gets nice and crispy. We'll crumble this over the chicken as a tasty garnish. Well, there it is. It looks wonderful. Let's find out just how it tastes. Wow, 18th century fried chicken. And the flavors are definitely a little different than what you're used to. That marinade does something really special. You get a little bit of a, that lemon flavor comes through, just a little bit, a hint of that, a wonderful flavor and the crispiness. The fried parsley is really interesting. Hmm. I really love this recipe. This one is great. Who would have thought 18th century fried chicken? It's great. I love this one and I think everyone should try it. I want to thank you for coming along as we experiment. We try these really interesting things out, this food from history. I want to thank you for joining me as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Hi, I'm John Townsend and today we're embarking on a series about baking and roasting in this very versatile utensil here, the Dutch oven. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. There's a very interesting book that was published in the early 19th century. It was published in 1837, but it was actually written in 1832 and it's by Catherine Strickland Parr. It's called The Backwoods of Canada. And she originally wrote this book as a series of letters to her sister talking about life on the frontier in Canada. And it's really amazing. She has a whole section of the book where she talks about Dutch ovens, or she calls them bake kettles. Now, as a regular English, proper English woman, she probably wouldn't have used something like this in her regular home. But she definitely found they were amazingly useful on the frontier. And let's hear a little bit about what she says about bake kettles. She says, At first I was inclined to grumble and rebel against the expediency of bake pans or bake kettles. But as cooking stoves, iron stoves, or, and even brick and clay built ovens will not start up at your bidding in the bush, these substitutes are valuable and perform a number of uses. I have eaten excellent light bread baked on immigrant hearths in one of these kettles. I have eaten boiled potatoes, baked meats, excellent stews, good soups, and all, all cooked at different times in this useful, a universally useful utensil. So let it not be despised. It is one of those things particularly adapted to the circumstances of settlers in the bush before they have collected those comforts about their homesteads within and without that are the reward and the slow gleaning up of many years toil. So you can see how much she loved to use this very versatile tool. And you know, it's one thing to say fry in one of these or bake a soup or I mean cook a soup or a stew in a kettle like this, but it's another thing to learn how to bake and to roast it where you really have to regulate the temperatures. That's what we'll be focusing on today. Again, it might not seem that easy, but with a little study, we'll get it. So let's look at the anatomy of this Dutch oven for a little bit before we uh, get started warming it up. Uh, you can see that it's got a, a lid. It's a special lid. Dutch ovens, this, this lid, this idea, the rim on here is specifically so that we can put coals up on top of this and them not fall off. This really is sort of an, an American invention right there in the late 18th century and early 19th century. It really kind of sets these apart and makes them specifically good for this purpose. So this helps with the specific idea of Dutch oven baking, which is that we want to have heat underneath the cooking pot and we want to have coals up on top 
to give you heat from both directions. Now, one of the things that'll happen is, is once you get this idea, you'll think, well, I know, I'll just pile coals up on top of this pot. And that really is the problem. We don't want to have too much on top or else we'll just overheat this. We'll get too much uh, heat in too rapidly and burn whatever we're cooking. So it really is a balance between getting enough heat uh, a below and above, but not too much. That's what we're going to be studying here in just a moment. Another thing we really need to do to bake in this properly is a, a good bed of coals. So you have a lot of pre-prepared coals. You can't cook with flaming logs. You really need to have a nice deep bed of coals and coals you can keep getting from the fire. So if you don't have a good bank of them ready to go, then you might run out just when you needed more. Also, there are environmental factors to take into consideration. Uh, ambient temperature outside really isn't that important uh, that you have to really keep in mind, but wind is. If you've got a lot of wind coming in, it'll hit that pot and take away the heat. And so it can be very difficult to bake. So if you've got a windy situation, you're going to need to protect that Dutch oven baking area from a lot of that wind. You'll need to make some kind of a windbreak. If you go searching online, you'll likely find formulas for baking with Dutch ovens. And the formula usually goes something like this. If you want to get to 350 degrees, you take the inches of your Dutch oven, say a 10 inch Dutch oven, and you put three up and three down. You take the number of inches, you put take 10 uh, charcoal briquettes, and for the top you'd put 13 on, and you'd do seven underneath. So three minus and three uh, plus. But since we're not using charcoal briquettes, usually in a historic atmosphere like this, we're going to be using hardwood, uh, hardwood coals. So they aren't the same size as a charcoal briquette and they usually burn much hotter. So we have to experiment more. We have to use our experience to get the right temperature. So when we're baking in a Dutch oven, we're trying to get the air temperature inside the Dutch oven to oven temperatures, right? 300, 350 degrees. We don't actually usually want to have our actual food right up against the side of the Dutch oven. And so we want to bring our food up off the off of the floor, away from the walls. So many times we'll use a trivet, something like this. Sometimes we could use little stones and a baking dish, especially if we're baking bread or some kind of pie in our oven. We want to have the pie plate up off the bottom with a trivet and we want to bake in something like this. Again, we're trying to get this the air temperature up to the right. To give you an idea what's happening inside the Dutch oven, we've actually got a, a modern heat probe in here and a little device. So we can, we can actually read the temperature of the inside of the Dutch oven as we put coals on top uh, and underneath. We can watch and that will give us an idea about exactly what we're going to do in the future. Let's start off experimenting with just a scoop full of coals down below that we're, we'll spread out and another scoopful that we will spread on the top of the lid here and make sure they're all around the edge, not necessarily in the center. There you go. It's only been a minute or two and just that handful of coals has already raised the temperature uh, 160 degrees and still going higher. Okay, our temperature seemed to level off at about 200 degrees. So let's put another scoopful, a light scoopful on the lid and see what happens. So it's been 10 minutes with, so we've had just one scoop at the bottom, two scoops on top. Our temperature is already to 260 degrees. So you can see it really doesn't take too long to, to get it up to almost baking temperatures. Obviously we'll need a little bit more to get it to where we would want to bake bread or something. You have to really be careful about taking the lid off and checking your baking a lot. If you do that, you'll extend the baking period uh, a, a great deal because the temperature will go down uh, inside the oven a lot. Well, we're just about to 350 degrees in the internal temperature here. We've got two scoops of hardwood coals underneath and three scoops up on the lid. And this is a 12 inch Dutch oven. If you're working with a smaller Dutch oven, obviously uh, you'll need fewer coals and a bigger one, uh, obviously more coals. And as these coals die down, they'll need to be replenished. So you can see you have to be kind of, you have to be watching this all the time. And the more you bake like this, the easier it will become. So there's a lot of heat, not only going down from the lid of this, but coming up off of the lid. 
And one of the beauties of Dutch ovens is you can stack them up to conserve your coals so that these, this set of coals on this lid will actually be the bottom coals for another Dutch oven that's up on top. So we preheated this oven. Uh, it's well, well up into temperature. In fact, what we'd like to do is go ahead and bake bread while this is hot. Now bread needs to be really hot, 450, 425 degrees. So we put an extra scoop down below and an extra scoop on top. Now with this 12 inch Dutch oven, it's completely level on top and it should be about up to temperature. And I've got some dough that's already ready to go in the oven. This is risen. So let's get it in the oven and get it baking. Well, here's the bread. It's, um, well, it's not right out of the oven because I let it cool down. It's still really, really warm. The problem with baking bread at an event is you really need to let it totally cool off, maybe even all night long until the next day for the crumb to set up. Now I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna rip this bread open. We're gonna have some right away. It smells wonderful. It's still steaming inside. The crumb had set up enough, so it should be perfect. Hmm. Bread right out of the oven. Wow. This this bread was really, it really was not so difficult at all in the Dutch oven. Uh, you have to pay attention to it. You have to have a little experiment, uh, experience, and you, you have to do some, you, you probably have to fail on three or four loaves before you get it. Um, this one probably could use just a little bit more heat underneath. But again, I mean, we're still, we're still learning. And uh, it, it is so simple. And you can do it at an event without great quantities of equipment. Just a simple Dutch oven. Bread is so wonderful when you can bake it out an event. I'm telling you, everybody will love you. Hi, I'm John Townsend. We're continuing our series in Dutch oven cooking. And in this episode, we'll be baking a roast. In 1837, Catherine Strickland Parr wrote a little book called The Backwoods of Canada. And in this book, she's giving advice to folks that are going out into the frontier of Canada. And she has some amazing advice about not shunning this particular cooking device. And it's called, she calls it a bake kettle. And today we call them Dutch ovens. She talks about how highly versatile they are, that you can bake breads, you can cook meats in them and roast in them, all these different things. Today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to roast beef in a Dutch oven. So today's recipe comes from the little cookbook called Domestic Economy. It's 1794 and it's Maximilian Haselmore. And this recipe is called uh, rump au ragu. Basically, we know it as pot roast. So the ingredients we're using today really haven't changed. It, it's basically just like a pot roast you would do today. I've got a two and a half pound rump roast and we've got carrots and onions. Uh, so, you know, let's put this together. Let's season this with salt and pepper on all the different sides. Now, Dredge this in a little bit of flour. Okay, this looks good. Let's brown it in the pan. Okay, let's get this pan nice and hot to brown this. Uh, this is already probably pretty much up to temperature. Let's toss in some of our butter here. Yeah, it's hot. And here goes the meat. You want to simmer this until it's nicely browned on all sides. That side looks good. Now that our meat is browned on all sides, I can remove it from the pan and deglaze the pan. I'm doing this with cider. The original recipe actually calls for the use of small beer, but of course you really can't find that today. So cider is gonna work fine for this. Uh, I'm using maybe a cup or two here and just uh, scraping all the gunk off the bottom of the pan. Now the meat goes back into the pan and we will uh, place around that some onions. I've just half sliced these onions, there's three or four here, and three or four carrots cut up, not too small. Now we can put in this special little onion. You see, 
You see this uh, onion here, it's an onion that's got cloves in it. This is very, very common uh, in 18th and 19th century uh, um, recipes. And we'll just toss this in right up on top. And now in go some herbs. I've got thyme and rosemary. We'll put those right up on top. Next comes beef broth. I'm gonna pour this until it's maybe two thirds the way up the side of the roast or so, that looks good. Now we can put the lid back on and we're not gonna put it back on the fire, but we're gonna put it on a very regulated, a very controlled area. We want this to just bake at say 300 to maybe 350 degrees tops. So we don't wanna just set it on the fire. It would cook too, too quickly. We want this to take three hours to cook. Now it's time to get this cooking area ready to bake. I'm gonna put a layer of coals down first. This is uh, a little more than I would normally put down because this ground is wet, but uh, these will probably die off pretty rapidly and we're gonna to have to come back and check. Now that that's in, let's lay the oven on top of those. And now I'm gonna put in a layer of coals on top of the lid. Now, it's just a little bit, right around the outside edge. We don't wanna just heap this up. It'll get way too hot. Now, let's keep watching this. Every 10 to 15 minutes, I'm gonna come back and check this oven to make sure that we haven't gotten too cold or that we're not too hot. And make sure to take this off and check the lower bed to make sure they haven't died out. Remember, not too much at the bottom. So every 10 or 15 minutes when we check underneath, we also want to rotate the, the pot as it goes. So we're gonna rotate the Dutch oven 90 degrees and we're gonna rotate the lid 90 degrees to keep that heat even as even as possible. Now let's check underneath this oven and look, oh yes, these lower coals are way too cool now. We, I need to put a few more coals down underneath to keep that heat going and I'm gonna check the top. This still feels really good so I don't need to add any top coals just yet. Our beef has been uh, in the Dutch oven for well over th three hours and it's very done. So I'm gonna remove all the contents of the Dutch oven here, the gravy, the meat, and the, the vegetables. And now in this empty pan, I'm gonna put in a little butter and a little flour. We're gonna make a roux and brown this uh, butter and flour up. And now we can return the gravy back in there so we get a nice thick sauce. And after our gravy is thickened, in go the mushrooms, about a half a pound of mushrooms sliced in half. Well, this is, it smells terrific. It smelled terrific the whole time uh, while we were waiting for it to be done. It looks wonderful. Uh, mushroom ketchup is one of those things that we could have even put into the gravy. I'm gonna put a little bit up on top because I know that'll add just, just a little bit that I really love. There we go. And now let's give it a try. Mm. The meat was done to perfection. Nice and tender. And um, all the vegetables are nice and tender too, but not, not mushy. Um, and that mushroom ketchup goes perfectly with this kind of a dish. This is wonderful and simple. Uh, it takes time, time to cook, but uh, really such a wonderful dish for a large setting, a, a great family dish, wonderful. This came right out of the Dutch oven. Do not be afraid to try uh, using the Dutch oven for dishes like this. Very simple um, and works perfectly. I, I want to thank you for coming along as we, you know, continue to, to try these things out, as we continue to savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Hi, I'm John Townsend. We're continuing our series in Dutch oven cooking. Today we're going to be using the, the skills that we've learned earlier to bake a pudding, a bread pudding, in one of these Dutch ovens. This recipe is rather simple. It's from the Primitive Cookery Cookbook, 1767. That cookbook is available on our website and in our print catalog. Uh, let's get these simple ingredients together. Our ingredients are rather simple. We've got three quarters of a cup of flour along with one cup of bread crumbs. Also four ounces of raisins or currants. I've got two tablespoons of sugar 
and just a half a teaspoon or so of ground ginger. For the wet ingredients, I've got two whole eggs and two egg yolks, and one cup of heavy cream. Now that we've got the wet ingredients all beat up, let's pour them in, mix the two together. We're looking for a nice, thick batter. I'm gonna turn this out into a well-buttered dish. This is ready to go. Let's put it in the oven. It's a beautiful day out and there's very little wind, so we found by previous experience with a 12-inch Dutch oven like this, we'll need about two scoops of coals beneath and three scoops on top. We want this to bake for uh, about 45 minutes at 350 degrees. If you haven't watched our previous episode where we talk about getting these ovens up to heat, make sure to go back and check those out. I've let this cool and we're gonna turn it out onto a plate and now slice it. And oh yes, we need finally the thing that really sets all these puddings off is the pudding sauce. Do not forget the pudding sauce. This particular sauce is one third butter, one third sugar and one third brandy. So let's give this a try. Mm. Superb flavors. And that sauce, I could eat that sauce all day. It is wonderful. A great little pudding. Very easy to bake in one of these Dutch ovens. Extremely easy to mix up and very simple ingredients. Curds aren't something you find in recipe books today, at least very often. But in the 18th century, it was a common ingredient. In this episode, we're doing a wonderful curd fritter. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. This recipe is from Eliza Smith's Complete Housewife from 1758. Very interesting um, recipe. The first thing we really need here are curds. And what we're gonna do today is to make curds for this recipe. You may be able to find curds in the grocery store today. They're definitely becoming a more popular item. If you can't find them in the store, they're very easy to make. In order to make curds, we need rennet. Uh, rennet is an enzyme that's found in the lining of calves' stomachs, and it's there to make it so that the milk that comes in curdles immediately, and it's to make it digestible for the calf. Today we're using animal rennet that we purchased online, and in the 18th century they would have used something that was essentially the same thing. They would have had a calf's stomach that they would have dried, they would have sliced that into tiny pieces, and they would use a tiny little piece to put into their milk to curdle it. But really, what's happening here is almost exactly the same thing. The recipe calls for a handful of curds. We've got about a half a gallon here. Uh, this should uh, yield approximately eight ounces of curds. I'm guessing that's a handful. Uh, I've put the, the uh, milk down here by the fire. I wanna get it to blood warm, just under 100 degrees. So I'm not put it, I don't wanna put it over the fire. I don't wanna risk cooking it, heating it up too much. Just, just by the fire. Make sure to stir this while you're heating it up slowly. And if you're doing it by the fire like I am, make sure to cover it so you don't get too many ashes in the milk. So it doesn't really matter what kind of milk you use, either 2% or, or whole milk, but it does matter whether it's ultra pasteurized or not. You can use standard pasteurized, homogenized milk for this, but if it's ultra pasteurized, it's just not gonna work. The temperature is perfect. It's taken a little while, but let's get this over and uh, put the rennet in it. The rennet procedure is pretty simple, but we have to do it right. We need approximately a half a teaspoon for this amount of milk of the, uh, the liquid rennet. I'm stirring this into a quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. Now let's add this to our milk, but we have to just, we can't just dump this in. We need to slowly drizzle it around 
so that it gets in here very evenly, just a little bit at a time. And now I'm gonna give it one very gentle stir. And now I'm gonna set this aside, the spoon aside. Um, maybe I'm gonna cover this up and let it rest for 15 or 20 minutes for this curd to set up. It's been 20 minutes, it's time to check the curd to see if it's ready to work with. The way to test the curds to see if it's ready is to stick your finger or a knife in, sort of like this, tilt the blade up, and if you see that it, the curd breaks cleanly, it's ready. Now we need to cut the curd, and we cut the curd so that it can release its way. We cut it in a crisscross pattern all the way to the bottom, about a three quarter inch wide strips, one way and then another. And now I'm gonna come in and actually cut it at an angle, 45 degrees away from my grid and 45 degrees at an angle in, again, to help release that way. And we'll do this in the opposite direction just one more time. Now we're going to let this set another 20 minutes to a half hour so that it can continue to release the way completely. Well, after a half an hour, you can definitely see that the whey is separated from the curd. Once the whey is separated, you're gonna to wanna to put this back by the fire for a good 20 minutes, trying to bring this up to a temperature of say 110 degrees or so. This will help it separate out a little bit better. Line a sieve with cheesecloth. Now we can pour our curds in. Once I have this tied up, I can hang it so that it can drain completely. Okay, so we had difficulties with the curd here at the campfire, at the campsite. You really need to keep these up to the right kind of temperature or they're not gonna separate, right? So we had to fight our curds. So the curds are ready. Now it's time to make the, the batter. We have a handful of flour. To that, we're gonna add our spices. We've got some nutmeg here, maybe a quarter of a nutmeg, uh, some mace, maybe a half a teaspoon, and a quarter a teaspoon of clove. They kind of go together as a threesome in many of these recipes. And now, two teaspoons of sugar. We probably don't need a lot here because some of that's gonna go on the top as they come out after, they, after they're done cooking. I'm gonna set these dry ingredients aside for just a second and let's bring on our eggs. The recipe calls for 10 eggs. Now, 18th century eggs might have been a little bit smaller, so you might not need so many if you're using uh, regular large eggs from the grocery store, maybe eight. I've got 10 eggs here. I'm gonna whisk these up, put them in the big bowl, and now I'm gonna sift in the dry ingredients to try to get this all mixed in nice, right? Okay, that's looking good. Let's put the curds in. I'm gonna break these up with my fingers and put them in the mix and stir it in with the spoon. If it's a little thin, well, you can bring in a little bit more flour. Again, they didn't have exact measurements here. You know, a handful of flour, a handful of curds. You really just have to make your way through this, get it to the right consistency that you feel is gonna work. It's a really, it should be a thick batter. And now for a little sugar on top. Well, here they are. They, they look really interesting. And um, I could tell by the way they went in that they, they definitely looked interesting in that how, how they were gonna turn out. And you can see from this shot internally, they're very eggy um, and not like, a, say, an elephant ear that you might be used to. Let's find out what they taste like. Hey, oh, I love the nutmeg in there. Mm. 
I think the cheese is just in there for a texture. And the cheese doesn't bring a lot of, uh, you know, kind of a cheesy flavor with it because it doesn't have a lot of salt in it. But you get some of the wonderful um, egginess. You get the wonderful spices that were in there. And it definitely needed a good bit of sugar up on top because we didn't have a lot in the batter. You might want to put a little bit more sugar in the batter than we did to sweeten it up just a bit more. That way you don't have to put maybe so much sugar on the outside. A great dish to try out. These, are, these fritters are... So, you've never had anything like them. I can tell you that right now. You know we struggled with this one, but it still turned out great. I want to thank you for coming along as we experiment, as we try out these things. We, we never know how they're going to turn out. I love it when we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. We're here today at Connor Prairie in Fishers, Indiana. It's a premier living historic site, and we've got a wonderful recipe for you. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. I'm here today with Mrs. Curtis, and she's promised to show me this amazing recipe for Parmesan ice cream. Now, when I first heard Parmesan ice cream, number one, I love ice cream and I love Parmesan, but I thought, now wait a minute. Two together. <laughs> Tell me about this Parmesan ice cream. I think you'll love it. It's a savory ice cream. Okay. But it has a little bit of sweet and it's very, very creamy. And it's so easy to go down your throat. I can't wait to try it. Let's get started. All right. Well, to begin the receipt, we have to have six eggs. Okay. We've already tested the eggs, so we know that they all sank to the bottom and they're fresh. So if you'd begin, let's okay. break each one. Once these eggs are all in, okay. then we will whisk those. And to that, we're going to add three ounces of grated Parmesan cheese. If you want the best flavor with this recipe, make sure you use actual real Parmesan cheese. Parmesan Reggiano, not any of the processed Parmesan cheese that comes in a green can. Don't even try it with that. You really want the real stuff. Then we're going to add one cup of syrup. Okay. The syrup is two cups of sugar put with one cup of water and simmered until it okay. dissolves. To that we're going to add two cups of cream. And stir that well. Okay. Now that it's well mixed, I have a pot for that to go into and we'll right. put it over the fire. This is ready to go in. Mm -hmm. It's just a simple custard. So we're going to set this over the fire. What, what kind of temperature are we trying to get to here? I would say uh, low medium. As we're stirring with the spoon, every so often we're going to pull the spoon out, drag your finger across the back. So once it's ready, it should leave an open spot that doesn't close up. We'll take it off the fire and we'll allow it to cool for about 30 minutes. So tell me a bit about this Parmesan cheese. Where did it come from? Well, I was thankful that the Zimmermans were going down to Cincinnati. Mm. This Parmesan cheese was shipped in from Europe and made it all the way down to Cincinnati. And uh, the Dr. Campbell had requested I come to make some ice cream for guests. So Parmesan being a hard cheese and mm. being very salted, it is uh, well preserved. Oh yeah, long last, it travels mm -hmm. well. Stores very, very well. Good. Now that our cream is cooled down, we're ready to put it into the sabatier. Okay, this is our ice cream maker, a sabatier. And we're not filling this up. No, we just not at want all. it. It's only about a third full or a mm -hmm. quarter full. But we can put the lid on it now. Put a little salt in on top of the ice. So that we've, we've already in. got ice in just here. Just a small layer. Mm -hmm. And the salt's going to make that really cold. Okay. So let's slip that in on top. And now we put some ice around the outside. Right. Well, as I mentioned, Mrs. Zimmerman has asked me to come down to do this because the doctor has family coming in. And her brother up in Noblesville has an ice house. And so uh -huh. he doesn't have much left, but he was willing to share in order for the doctor's Just for this family recipe. to have this, yes. Mm, but we promised we'd keep him some ice cream. I'll bet. He better hurry while it's he still cold. Hurry. So we've got the ice all the way up, almost to this bottom rim here. Mm -hmm. Now I start turning it, right? No. No, we don't. <laughs> it has to set for about seven, eight minutes because during that time it's really getting the canister good and cold. Okay. And then once that time has passed, you will get 10 minutes of churning. I'm rotating. 
We're getting close. What okay. we have to do next is we'll wipe off the top, we'll mm -hmm. take off the lid, we'll do a scrape down because all of the ice cream iced cream is forming around the edges right. up close to the um, sabatier. So we'll scrape that down so that the other cream can move in and it can continue to freeze. Get freezing. Okay. So now that we've scraped down the sides, you can see it's starting to firm up. Oh yeah, it looks good. So we'll put the lid back on. Okay. I'm not going to work it again yet. Okay. You're going to let it set just a few more minutes and then you have another 10 minutes to, to try. Okay. Well, it should be just about finished. It has been about three cycles, 10 minutes to churn, 10 minutes in between. So usually about an hour is the amount of time it takes to finish this off. Well, let's see what so it looks like. Ah, oh, yes. The consistency looks perfect. We could probably let this set and have it stiffen up even further, but then it would be hard to get out. Yes. Well, I can't wait to try this. Go ahead. Okay does look good. Do you get a little bit of the cheese whiff off of it? I never wait long enough to smell well, I, I can believe that. Whoa. That is really, really good. You you don't get any cheese texture out of it, but you get that cheese flavor. Very savory. And it comes in a little later, that, mm -hmm. that cheese. First it's a little sweet, like ice cream, mm -hmm. and then mm, it warms up. The salty taste. Oh yeah. Too. Excellent, excellent ice cream. You I'm would, you I don't it. think anybody would believe Parmesan ice cream. It's amazing. You really have to try it. Well, I want to thank you, Mrs. Curtis, for sharing this recipe with us. It is amazing. It is wonderful. So glad you enjoyed it. I hope the doctor's family enjoys it too. I am sure they will. <laughs> Good. If you get a chance to come here to Connor Prairie, if you're in this area, you really should come here. This is an amazing site. You will love it, I promise you. Thank you so much for coming along with us as we discover these amazing flavors, all, as, as we savor these flavors and the aromas of the 18th and early 19th century. I'm here today with Miss Barker and we're going to talk about rye and Indian bread. So explain to me a little bit about what we're cooking here today. We call it rye and Indian bread because it's made of part rye flour and Indian meal, or sometimes we call it cornmeal. And you can use just those two grains to make the flour, or you can use wheat flour. We've actually put some wheat flour into it because it's a good way to, to stretch your wheat if you don't have a whole lot. See here in Indiana, we have a lot of corn, so um, and we grow rye very easily too, and wheat is more of a second crop. so we have a much more abundance of corn. So this is a bread that's good for stretching since we eat bread three times a day. Um, but it's very similar to a cornbread, but more of a mix between a cornbread and an Indian pudding. Tell me the, the, the difficulties that we're gonna have with, with corn and making bread. Why can't we just make bread with corn? Well, you could, but it would be quite dense and a little bit crumbly. So a lot of folks, especially with making rye and Indian bread, they'll say to scald the meal, right. which add boiling water. But I find that that makes a very pasty bread, mm. um, very dense. Um, if you like that, then that's what you should do. But um, we're just gonna put plain water into it. And then we're also um, putting the wheat flour in there to give it a little bit more chew. It'll bind together a little bit more. It'll be um, a little bit sturdier. Well, let's get started. What do we need to make this? Well, first you need to start off with some sponge. Now this is um, just a regular old sponge. It's got lively yeast into it. Mm -hmm. We've broken down one of our um, yeast cakes, which we've made um, recently. So, but it's basically just about a cup of lively yeast. And then we're gonna add to that about a half a teacup of molasses. Right. You can add more or less to your taste. Um, mm -hmm. It makes it quite dark if you add a lot of it, but if you like it sweeter, then you just do what you please. And I'm gonna add maybe three quarters cup of water. Right. And then what we have in our bowl is one cup of Indian meal, one cup of rye flour, two cups of wheat flour, and two teaspoons of salt. If you wanna put that in here, I'll stir okay. while you pour. And once it comes to a ball, you're gonna have to start kneading it. And kneading it is important. Really resist the urge to add water until you really get your hands into it. So I think it's really important to, to get at least one hand into it. 
because the spoon's not going to do you any good from this point. And I come from a potter's family, so I like to knead in a bowl. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to knead this for about 10 minutes or so until it becomes nice and strong. And it's not sticking to your hands too much. Now, don't ever look for it to never stick to your hands. Because of that molasses, it's going to stick. Oh, yeah. So tell me a little bit about, about the, the leaven that you've used in this. Uh, you just had a sponge, but what was this sponge made out of? Well, um, you can get it from live lamb things, um, which is mm -hmm. like uh, whenever you go to your brewer, mm -hmm. you ask for some beer barm. Mm -hmm. And that barm is what you can use to start your bread. And you can start a, a, a live yeast that you can keep at your house as long as you keep feeding it. Right. Um, so basically that was, you know, you just get a little maybe teacup full of barm and feed it some flour mm -hmm. and some water, equal parts, and then you stir it up and then that's that. I would right. let it sit for a bit. Right. And then, uh, then that'll make your bread. And if you wanted to preserve that, you could make your yeast cakes. And so to that mixture that I just told you, you should add some cornmeal until it becomes a very stiff um, batter like biscuits. Mm -hmm. Cut them into biscuit shapes, and then you just um, lay them out to dry. Right. And that's and then that's what you've used here to yes, make this. Yes, indeed. So to um, reconstitute this, you just crumble this up and add some warm water to it. Two of these will make a nice uh, loaf of bread. And it'll. It'll get active and alive again yes. after a few hours or And half in the a day. summertime, you know, it's a lot faster to yeah. make bread than it is in the winter. How's our ball doing? It's it is good and strong now. It's very, very stiff. It's still sticky to the touch. So when it gets to that point when you've kneaded it about uh, eight or ten minutes or so, mm -hmm. you wanna put it into a ball shape and you see it's very dense. Yeah, it's that's tough. But that is gonna keep you going throughout okay. the day. Okay. So I'm gonna put we've got a bowl here, I'm gonna line it with a towel. Okay. Um, and then just sprinkle a generous amount of flour, whatever mm -hmm. flour you please, really. And then you want to put the good side down. Okay. So, so that will be the top of the loaf when we're done. Yes. Okay. And then we're just going to let it rest until it is never going to get double in size. Um, when it does get that size, it's going to be too uh, deflated. So wow. uh, just let it get 50% larger. Well, we've got one that we made earlier. And as Here you see, go. it's not very tall. Right. But it's going to be, uh, that's going to give it just enough chew and rise. It's not going to be as dense as a cornbread. So these were the same size? Yes, indeed. Okay. So it has grown a little bit. It's kind of flattened out and we've got, you can see that it's some holes. it's grown some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's and it's light to the touch. It's uh, it's not near as dense as this. It's, it's gotten okay. some air into that it. That so. looks great. Earlier I prepared the oven with um, some hot coals from the hearth. We cheated a little, but every cook knows that you don't ever let your fire go out. So I had some little sticks and then some larger sticks and we put them in there and with a little bit of some wood shavings we got the fire going it was a small fire we let that burn down a little bit and then we pushed it to the middle and then made another small fire and then let let that burn down and then we put the pot coals we distribute them around the bottom to let the bricks really soak up that heat and then i pushed them to the back and put my door on to really keep the heat in now we're just going to wait until uh, the coals die down completely and i'll rake them out so exactly how long does it take to get this oven up to temperature? Um, depends on how long you want to use it. Since we're only baking a couple loaves of bread, uh, it's only about two hours. If you wanted to use it all day long, I would suggest maybe at least three hours. So tell me about the oven and the setting that we have here with your house. Well, this is uh, the Zimmerman's Bake Oven, and uh -huh. they uh, asked Dr. Campbell if they could put it on their property, and this is the inn. So if you need a place to stay, they've got a really nice facility. Um, but it's it's managed by Dr. Campbell, and this is a wonderful tool now that Mrs. Zimmerman has to use. And and we actually, my family being potters, we provided the clay. It's mostly made out of clay, sand, and straw, and different ratios. And so it's about 11 inches thick and uh, 30 uh, inches in diameter inside. On the inside, right. Yeah, so it can fit uh, six loaves of bread very comfortably, mm. and it can keep heat for six hours plus. So once the oven has been swabbed out, we're going to cast on some cornmeal to see how hot the oven is. If the oven is too hot, the cornmeal will burn immediately. Um, and if that's the case, just let it cool down some. But uh, if it just toasts, then it's ready to use.
So the loaf is done. The, the bread smells amazing. I can't wait to try this. Let's, I'll let you cut into yes, it. Yes, indeed. Hmm. That's wonderful. It's got a great texture to it. What, what comes out for you, for the most for you, flavor-wise? Um, definitely the cornmeal. And I would say, I would put molasses on it instead of butter. More in it, or more on it, or both. That's how I take my bread. Well, I really want to thank Miss Barker for showing us this wonderful uh, rye and Indian bread. It's a great recipe, and not very difficult to do. Not indeed. And I, I really want to encourage everyone who is in this area to come and check out Connor Prairie. It is an amazing site. It really is something that if you're anywhere close, you really should try to come and visit it. There's so many things here. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming along with us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th and early 19th century. Last week, we had Miss Barker, and she showed us how to make Ryan Indian bread. Today, Mrs. Barker is going to show us how to make pork a la Norman. That's what it's called. You got it right. Okay. Uh, now, that's a fancy name for it. Yeah? Uh, it just really is pork and apples insider. Okay. But apparently, folks in Normandy, that's what they eat. Right. So a traveler come through, he give me this receipt, that's what he called it. Right. My husband called it pork insider. Well, we got us some good uh, hog. It's been uh, about a pound and a half, been cubed up and fat trimmed from it. Some salt and some pepper and uh, about a, a half a teacup of flour, a uh, couple of uh, teaspoons of nutmeg, about half a nut mm. grated, yeah. uh, a medium onion chopped, and a nice tart green apple. Uh, a little bit ago, I put some uh, pieces of fat that I trimmed off right. the, the pork into the spider and rendered them off. So we're going to go ahead and take this this good this good hog, and I'm going to put it in a dish here, and I'm going to uh, just uh, sprinkle that flour over the top of it, and it'll be more than will cover it, and that's all right too. And 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 use your eye and use your sense. You got to cook yeah. when you cook with your nose and your mouth and your your eyes, your ears, uh, all parts of you. Put in what your family like. Uh, right. flavor-wise, if they like a bit more salt or pepper, and stir that round so all that flour gets on every piece of that pork, each side of it. So now I got to use my eyes and I need to put a need bit a more, more flour there. Yep. It should be uh, not not dry, but it shouldn't be wet. It shouldn't be like a paste mm. uh, there. You want, to, you want to have a bit of dry flour there. And then uh, we'll go ahead and we'll put this right in the spine. So once you got a bit of uh, color on that pork, you want to take it out your pan. Now go ahead and put it right back in that bowl because all that extra flour, that's going to go right back in again. That oh, will yeah. help you with your gravy. Sure. So the next thing you're going to do, and now if you don't have enough fat in your fire, go ahead and put a little uh, butter in your, in your spider. Mm -hmm. There, we'll just put a bit in and get a nice sizzle to it. And then if you wouldn't mind uh, taking them apples, and I'll right. take the onions. So once your onions and your apples is in, and, and you stir them around a bit, and they uh, they start to cook, while well, you go ahead and sprinkle that nutmeg right on top of them, mix it around, and let them cook just a bit more, just till them onions just come a little bit clear. Right. And then once that's done, comes my husband's favorite part. Yeah. And that's the cider. Now, if you got your apple trees, why well, then you got your apples, applesauce, dried apples, apple pie, dried apple pie, but you certainly put up cider. So once that uh, apple and uh, onion and nutmeg have cooked down a little bit and that, that uh, cider's cooked off a bit, well, you're going to go ahead and add your pork right back in. All them drippings from that bowl that gathered up and stir that round, put your lid back on, then cover it with coals and then just back away uh, and go holler at your children for a half hour or more if you want. So it's ready. 
Now you make it, you make a, a face like that and you say something no. like that, sir. No. And, and I and I and I understand. Now some folk might look at this dish and they say, well, it ain't pretty. But it ain't always got to be pretty. What matters is the taste. I'm sure it's gonna taste wonderful too. I'm certain of it, sir. I'm certain of it. In fact, I'm so certain of it, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just go and just give you plenty to taste. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Wow, the apple flavor mm, is wonderful. I mean, that pork is delicious. Mm hmm. And more you let that, that cook, that pork will come more tender and more tender. The nice thing about making any kind of stew mm -hmm. is that you ain't got to have a, a, an expensive, uh, uh, high, high piece of meat. Right. You use your, your low meat, you use your, your shoulder, you use something that. that Ain't, ain't gonna have a lot of promise to it until it sits and stews for a bit and and, and all that meat just melt away and right and even if you have good. extra the next morning or the next day yes sir mm. yes sir although I got I got a, a a son that's near twice your size and I don't generally have extra <laughs> I bet you don't no sir well I really want to thank uh, mrs. Barker for inviting me in to her kitchen showing me how to make the best darn pork and cider I ever ate. And if you're ever in the Midwest and you have a chance to come here to Conner Prairie, this is a premier living history site right here in the Midwest. Definitely come and check this site out. It is wonderful. Uh, again, I want to thank you for coming along as we, as we experiment here, as we try these different things out of history, as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th and early 19th century. So this one's going to be great. What we're doing today is what appears to be a 190 year old recipe for curly fries. Well, at least we're going to find out. We recently found this recipe in Mary Randolph's The Virginia Housewife Cookbook. And it's a, a cookbook, one of the earliest American cookbooks from the very early 19th century. We usually think of french fries as a pretty modern dish. Now, this likely wasn't, say, a main course or even a side course, but an edible garnish. And that's probably why they took the time to cut these into a spiral, making spiral fries. Let's get started with this. This is pretty simple. First, we need to uh, peel a couple of potatoes. Then we need to slice these into quarter inch thick discs. The recipe now says to shave these discs in a spiral form. This seems to work best if you use the very tip of a sharp knife. Now that these have been patted dry, they're ready to fry. There you have it. Let's find out just what they taste like. Hmm. Amazing. Wonderful French fries. Great flavors. Very easy to make. Almost a almost a 200 year old recipe. Yet another amazing, simple, wonderful recipe. I hope you get a chance to try this. Journey cakes are an old world food born out of convenience. Taverns often served them to weary travelers. They were very portable and they could be taken on a trip. I'm about to demonstrate a very American version of the journey cake, one that uses a new world grain. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. Our recipe comes from a collection of recipes by Harriet Pickney Horry from about 1770. Let's get started. You're going to need whole hominy and you can often find it canned in your local grocery store. Now we hope to do an episode very soon on making your own hominy, but for now, this is just gonna have to do. We're using about a pint. 
We need to mash this into a pulp. You can make quick work of this if you're in a modern kitchen by pulsing it in a food processor. Next, we're going to be adding two gill of all-purpose flour. Now, the recipe calls for one, but we've found two works much better. A gill was a standard unit of measure in the 18th century, about four ounces. Probably its best known use was giving soldiers and sailors their daily rum ration, a practice that the British Navy continued until very recently. Interestingly, there was also the jack that was half the size of a gill. We offered these on our website. So, eight ounces of flour, two tablespoons of milk, a dash of salt, and mix it all together well. This recipe calls for baking these journey cakes on a bannock board. So I've got a nice uh, thin board here that we can use for a bannock board today. The cakes were pressed on and propped before the fire until they were baked. I'm dipping my spoon in the milk and smoothing this out, and this will also help brown the surface. If you're baking this at home, you can place this on a baking sheet lined with parchment paper. You probably need to bake this at 350 degrees for maybe 45 minutes or until it's nice and golden brown. So to bake with this bannock board, we're going to set it right by the fire, right up close to it. We don't want it to actually burn the board or catch it on fire, but you want to prop it up right up next to the fire so it can bake. This has been cooking about 30 minutes and we've been watching it rather closely. Uh, it's really, it's firmed up nicely and the color looks really good. So I think it's ready. So let's get this off the board. So I've got it cut off the board and it looks like it might have been able to bake a little bit longer. It's pretty soft on the underside, but no matter what you do when you're baking it on a bannock board like this, it's more cooked on one side than it is on the other. Let's give it a try. Wonderful, nice salty corn flavor, just like I like really. A lot of that flavor is what's coming in from the hominy itself because hominy has such a, you know, an umami to it. It's got a wonderful little flavor. So these turn out really good. And I suppose, you know, if we kept baking this, maybe even we flipped it over and kind of baked the backside a little bit, we could uh, use this as a travel cake. We could, we could put it in our haversack and take it on our, on our trip. Well, this, this journey cake would be a wonderful uh, thing to demonstrate at an event, especially for a traveler, a voyager, or a, or a soldier who wants something that you can do right at the campfire. Well, this journey cake was in a wonderful little experiment and it turned out great. I wanna thank you for coming along with us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. The recipe today comes from Amelia Simmons' 1796 cookbook called American Cookery. This celebrated little cookbook is considered to be the first truly American cookbook. The recipe today is for Indian slapjack, and just like the cookbook, this is a truly American recipe. Pancakes in the 18th century were very popular. A few years ago, we did a series on pancakes. I'll put a link down in the description section. I invite you to go check those out. With pancakes being so popular, it's no wonder that people would have adapted this old world recipe to ingredients that would be more available to them. In this case, where wheat flour would be more difficult to come by in the colonies, it's been replaced by cornmeal. I'll start by beating together one quart of milk with four eggs. Modern eggs are probably larger than what they would have had in the time period, so you might want to use three eggs and one egg yolk instead of four full eggs. For our dry ingredients, I'll mix together two cups of cornmeal, about a cup and a half of wheat flour, and maybe a teaspoon of salt. In the original recipe, Amelia Simmons calls for four spoonfuls of flour. So it's not very uncommon for these recipes to be very, let's say, lackadaisical in their measurements. And so we experimented with this and we found that one cup seemed to work just about right for this particular recipe. Most of these recipes seem more like suggestions than really hard and fast rules. Now, if you notice in this recipe so far, there isn't any kind of leavening. 
anything like, say, baking soda or baking powder. And it isn't until the mid-19th century, say 1850 or so, that you start to see leavening come into a recipe like this. Now, Amelia Simmons actually does use some chemical leavening in her 1796 cookbook, but not in anything like cornbread or pancakes. So let's add the dry ingredients very slowly while I whisk them into the wet ingredients. Now this is going to turn out very, very thin, but if we let this rest a little bit, then it'll, it'll start to thicken up. While it's thickening up, I'll prepare our pan for cooking these. So today I'm cooking with the brazier instead of over a campfire. So many people today, uh, because you're in drier regions or in different parts of the country, you really need to use a brazier. We offer these wonderful double braziers that really, they're the perfect size. A full piece of firewood will fit in these and they have a little uh, door that opens on the side here. The grill on top is great and there's even accessories so you can uh, put some other like a kettles and stuff off to the side a little bit higher and a heat shield underneath that you can almost use like a like a, a broiler in your oven so these these uh, double braziers are wonderful and very popular we also are going to be using a frying pan today now if i was over the campfire i'd use one of our spider skillets these are like a 10 inch skillet with legs on it so we can cook it right over the fire without any extra equipment but we also offer that same uh, frying pan without legs so we can use it on the brazier like we've got here today and we also have a couple of other uh, smaller frying pans one with a folding handle which is great for uh, trekkers or people who want to pack these in smaller uh, packs and then a standard smaller skillet here great for the stove at home or for your camping trips all these things the brazier its accessories all these frying pans all these are available in our print catalog or you can see them on our website i'll make sure to put a link down below in the description of this video i'm going to put a little butter in our skillet and then wipe it out about a quarter of a cup of our batter will work well per pancake Well, here are our Indian slapjacks. Of course, we need to put a little bit more on them. How about a little bit of butter? And of course, I've got some maple syrup. Very traditional North American, you know, topping for pancakes. And there we are. Let's give them a try. Whoa, it's got a very interesting texture. You know, we're used to these light and fluffy pancakes, usually with white flour, and you know, they're really thick. These are nice and flat, and they have a wonderful texture to them that you might not be used to as a, as a uh, pancake, but a very nice texture, and a great little corn flavor, and of course, butter and maple syrup. You can't go wrong with that. Great for the campsite. Very simple, not very many ingredients at all wonderful breakfast or even later in the day dish. I want to thank you for coming along as we experiment. You know, we never know how this is going to turn out, especially around the campfire. These turn out so wonderful. I want to thank you for coming along with me as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Today's recipe is called a French salad, and it comes from Maria Rundell's 1808 cookbook, A New System of Domestic Cookery. I know, 1808, now that's the early 19th century, isn't it? But it turns out that this is very similar to a number of different 18th century recipes for salad. Salads have been around for hundreds of years, even thousands of years. We know that the Romans had salads, and especially in the 17th and 18th century, the French and Italians were known for their salads. Now the salads, this one's called a French salad, and that's quite likely because the, the English were so fond of French cooking, and in fact they imported French cooks to cook for them, and so salads were kind of known as a, as a French dish in the English culture. In the 18th century, salads took on many different forms. Of course, they had their cabbages and their lettuces. In fact, today we know this as romaine lettuce. In the 18th century, it was just Roman lettuce. They also had a variety of vegetables. 
endive, radish tops, leeks, and green onions were commonly used, some vegetable salads were raw, and some were cooked or even boiled. Other salads used meats or pickled fish. They also used herbs in their salads, not just as accents, but as major ingredients, things we might never put into a salad. Now, many people think of flowers in a salad as a new thing, but in fact, in the 18th century, flowers were very common in salads. They had periwinkle and, and violets, nasturtiums. Those were all in 18th century uh, salad recipes. Sometimes they were fresh and other times they might be candied. They were favored for their not only their color, but their flavor also. Now, what we're making today is a meat salad. Now, the common element that seems to tie all these kinds of salads together was the dressing, which was usually some kind of a vinaigrette. And that's where we're going to start. I'm going to mince two or three anchovies and put those in a large bowl, mix them with one chopped shallot and about three quarters of a cup of chopped parsley. The recipe calls for oil, about a tablespoon of oil. And I'm using olive oil here. Now, occasionally they would have used, say, an almond oil also in an 18th century recipe like this. And that might be an interesting variation you could try. So now let's add the acid. We need about twice as much acid. The recipe calls just for vinegar. Now, likely what they mean is a malt vinegar in the time period. I'm not using malt vinegar today, but actually uh, half lemon juice, about two tablespoons, and half uh, distilled vinegar. To this, I'll add a teaspoon of, say, the mustard of my choice, along with a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and I'm going to whisk this together. Now it's time for the meat. I have here some roasted chicken. It's about three quarters of a pound that I had from earlier. It's completely cooled. And I can start to add this to our vinaigrette. This needs to be covered and set aside for about three hours so that the flavors can blend. I suggest you store it in a cool place like your refrigerator. So let's give this a try. Mm. Wonderful blend of flavors. They're all right there. You can get a little bit of that lemon juice, but it's not overpowering and it works so well with that oil. It all blends together so well and those flavors are just boom. They're just right there. So this one is really good and they likely would have served this over toast or, you know, in a modern context, this would go really good on a croissant, although they didn't have anything quite like that in the 18th century, but still. And you could just eat it just like this, just right out of a bowl. It is great. And I want to thank you for coming along as we try out these really interesting recipes from history, as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Corn in the 17th and 18th century was extremely important for not only native peoples, but for European colonists also. And some of the dishes favored by the First Nations peoples were also favorites of the colonists. Succotash is a very interesting dish. Uh, it remains popular even to this day in certain regions of the United States. The very first um, recipe that we've found published for succotash is from the mid 1800s, but it's a much older dish. To learn about the earlier history of this food, you have to turn to old travel journals of European explorers and settlers. The word succotash is a phonetic mutation of a number of similar Native American words. And the earliest that we've found this dish by name, uh, at least that we have found, is from Jonathan Carver's book from 1778, Travels Throughout the Interior Parts of North America. Here's a little excerpt. One dish which answers nearly the same as bread is in use among a number of eastern nations where Indian corn grows. It is reckoned extremely palatable by all the Europeans who enter their dominions. This is composed of their unripe corn as before described and beans in the same state boiled together with bear's flesh. 
which renders it beyond comparison delicious, and they call this food succotash. The earliest reference we found to succotash did not call it by name. It's a reference from 1674 by Daniel Gookin, and it is titled Historical Collections of the Indians in New England. Their food is generally boiled maize or Indian corn mixed with kidney beans, or sometimes without. Also, they frequently boil in this pottage fish and flesh of all sorts, either newly taken or dried. And also, they mix with the said pottage several sorts of roots, as Jerusalem artichokes and ground nuts and other roots and pumpkins and squashes and also several sorts of nuts or masts as acorns, chestnuts, walnuts, these husked and dried and powdered, they thicken their pottage therewith. By now, the dictionaries have settled on a spelling for succotash, and pretty much all the modern recipes you find for succotash are exactly the same. But as there were a number of ways to spell succotash in the 18th century, there were undoubtedly the same number of ways to fix it. Today's recipe is an adaptation. We're taking the mid-19th century recipe and we're adding to it some of the same things you'll find in the earlier references. I'm using diced jowl bacon for this, about four ounces. You can use regular bacon if you'd like. I'm going to brown this in our cast iron pot. As I read earlier, the Native Americans would have used, well, basically any meat they had available. It's likely that European settlers making this dish would use salt pork or bacon. If you'd like to make a vegetarian version of this dish, just leave out the meat. Once that's browned, we'll add two or three quarts of water, and we'll bring that up to a low boil. While that's warming up, I have to trim off the very last bit of corn here. I've got eight to ten ears. You want to be careful not to cut too closely to the cob. I'll explain why in just a moment. I've got about two pounds or say four cups of trimmed corn kernels. In addition, we need a cup and a half of beans. Today I'm using baby lima beans. Let's add the beans and the corn cobs to this boiling water, and I'm going to let this cook for about 20 minutes. If you trim your corn too close to the cob, then they'll give a disagreeable taste to the dish. You can use canned or dried kidney beans in this instead of the lima beans. If you use the dried beans, make sure to soak them overnight beforehand. Other vegetables may have been added to this, really depending on what was available in the season. Now I'm making a summertime version of succotash here. There, you could do a fall version or a winter version with dried beans, with dried hominy, and sometimes adding something like squash or pumpkin. Hopefully in the near future, we'll have an episode on making hominy. Jason Richards, one of our viewers, recently sent us a little cookbook on Native American cooking called Cherokee Cook Lore. We were fascinated to find a succotash recipe that had dried corn, dried beans, and squash. Thank you so much for sending that little cookbook to us, Jason. Once the beans and the cobs have been boiled for, say, 20 minutes or so, remove the cobs and add the corn kernels. Season this with some salt and black pepper. Then let it boil for another 15 minutes. Well, let's give this a try. This um, is something, if you want to top this off with a little bit of butter, you'll probably enjoy that. So I'm gonna add a little butter. Mm. Wonderful summertime flavors. You get that beautiful uh, corn, uh, like sweet corn flavor. The beans settle down very nicely in this. They don't come out too much. You know, I'm not a big fan of lima beans. Turns out really good in this dish. The juice is wonderful. And of course, you can't go wrong with butter and pepper on there as a seasoning. I'm sure they may not have had, you know, those kind of choices, but still a wonderful, wonderful flavors. A nice medley. And of course, the bacon flavor comes out at the very end. Very nice. This dish is great with its roots in 17th century and even earlier Native American cooking. 
I want to thank you for joining us today as, as we continue to experiment and try out these very interesting things as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Dutch ovens were extremely versatile, and that's one of the reasons why they were so popular in 18th and 19th century North America. Today we're doing a savory a beef steak pie. This recipe comes from Amelia Simmons' 1796 cookbook, American Cookery. Uh, if you haven't watched our earlier Dutch oven cookery series uh, explaining getting these ovens up to heat, I would encourage you to do so. I'm setting my 12-inch Dutch oven over a bed of coals and putting a few coals on top to preheat it so that it's ready to go when we're ready to put this pie in. To prepare this pie, I'm using a 9-inch redware pie plate. These are the pie plates that our master potter, Gary Nieder, makes. They're wonderful pie plates. You can find them on our website or in our print catalog. I'm lining the outside of the pie plate here with puff paste. And this is a real typical instruction you'll get in 18th century cookbooks to just line the outside with puff paste. Uh, you can use either puff paste that you buy at the store. You can find it in a frozen uh, food section, or there's a video that we do on making your own puff paste. I'll make sure to put a link down in the description section for that. I'm starting by placing a tablespoon and a half of butter in the bottom of my pie pan. In this recipe, we'll end up using about a quarter of a pound of butter, so be prepared for that. I've taken a two pound shoulder roast and I've sliced it in to about a half inch thick slices. And now I'm going to start to layer that in. So first, we put in a layer of our steak. This is a really nice cut. I've already trimmed all the gristle out. I'll follow this with a little bit of salt and pepper, and then I'll sprinkle a nice bit of flour on top of that. We want a good little layer here. This is going to make a great gravy. Next, I've got some nice big slices of white onion, and I'll top off this layer with another tablespoon of butter. Now we're going to repeat this again. Uh, again, we're going to put down some a steak, a layer of steak, nice and thin. We don't want it to double up here. And again, we put on the salt and the pepper and the flour and then the onions again. And after the onions, butter again. You should be able to get about three layers in your pie. Now that our pie has got its all the layers built together, now it's time to put in some liquid. And we can use a couple of different liquids. We could use water, uh, we could use hard cider or um, a small beer or a light beer if you've got that. Anything is gonna make a good uh, liquid for our pie. I'm gonna pour in some of the liquid uh, right now before I put the top on um, around the edges because it can be hard, hard to get all the all the liquid into the pie that we want to get. Now it's time to put on our puff paste top. And here's our puff paste that we're going to put on the top of our pie. And we'll put this on and pinch it down. You definitely want a good seal between the body of the pie crust and this top layer, there, this lid that we're going to put on. So make sure to wet the edge if the edges, if the top isn't going to seal well. Now make sure to pinch this lid down nice and tight. Then we're going to cut a little hole in the top and then pour in another tablespoon or two of our liquid on top of that, and then we're ready to bake. The pie is ready to go into the oven, and of course, I've already preheated this oven, so it should be close to temperature. I don't need to worry about that. Um, let's go ahead and remove the lid and place this pie in here gently, and let's close this up. This needs to cook rather slowly at a low temperature. We don't want to overheat this, so maybe 300 degrees is what we're shooting for. Um, we talked about trying to get a, keep a lower heat in an earlier in that earlier episode this series. Um, in this case, we want maybe a scoop and a half around the bottom edge of this Dutch oven. So make sure to refresh your coals after you've preheated and maybe two scoops on top, two and a half scoops max. We don't want to overdo this or else our meat will be tough if we cook this at too high a temperature. And from an earlier episode, we want to make sure to remember that we need to continue to rotate this oven 90 degrees every 15 or 20 minutes 
um, and we keep picking up it and rotating it around and rotate the lid separately. You want to keep rotating the lid. The problem, especially in this case where we've got the fire pit off to the side, it's going to be hotter on one side than the other. So that's why we want to keep rotating. And our coals might be hotter on one spot than the other. We don't want to overcook one spot over another. So we keep rotating those, the lid and the body around a little separately. Someone asked in an earlier episode about the tools I was using. And uh, really, I only need a couple real good tools uh, for Dutch oven cooking. You can do without some of these, but you really need a couple of them uh, to do it well and to do it easily, let's just say that. Um, mainly, we're definitely going to need a Dutch oven. We sell a couple different sizes of those. A trivet is probably the next most important piece. Um, a nice triangular trivet. If you don't want to have a trivet like this, you can just use a couple of stones that are the same size, three or four stones, or even an S-hook thrown in the bottom here, a couple S-hooks will do the same job. But the trivet does a really good job. I like to use a real trivet when possible. Um, a pie pan. Uh, these pie pans are great and they're, we use them so many times. It's, if you want to keep things up off the bottom, you're going to need to cook on top of that trivet with something like a pie plate. Also, um, a pair of these little um, uh, ember tongs, excellent for doing individual pieces. Sometimes you want to get pretty precise. The ember tongs help you pick those up and do some precise work. The uh, Dutch oven lid lifter is a killer tool that really makes it much easier to get the lid off of these without them falling over. I mean, you can just use a hook, but the lid can tilt and all your, all your uh, ashes can drop right into the Dutch oven, which ruins it. The Dutch oven lid lifter helps you lift that up and with these extra prongs, balance it so it stays level. So it's a really handy tool and you can just use the hook to pick up the whole Dutch oven and rotate it. You really need that kind of tool. Uh, also, you're going to need some kind of a shovel and uh, you really don't need a big shovel. These little um, hearth shovels that we have in the catalog are perfect. They pick up just the right amount of coals um, and they're nice and small and they don't have a, a, a handle that can burn up. So they're really handy for working with these Dutch ovens. And the last tool I really suggest is a pair of leather gloves. We don't have these in the catalog. You can get a pair of welding gloves. Look for something that's not looking too modern. You don't want blue ones. Uh, so if you can find a nice pair of, of uh, brown uh, welding gloves, these make it so much easier to get those pie pans out of there um, or to just lift up the oven or, or the lid at times when you don't want to burn yourself, obviously. So these are really helpful to have. Uh, there are some other tools that we don't carry that can make it easier. Like um, sometimes there's a special um, uh, tool to lift pie plates up out of the Dutch oven. Boy, that's a lot of bother to carry too many tools. This is probably enough for just about anybody. Wow, this looks tremendous. It is ready to go. You know, this reminds me of the beef pasty we did a number of years ago. So we definitely need to let this guy rest. Uh, it can even be eaten cold. And the colder we let this get, probably the more it's going to come out in one piece. I can't wait that long. So let's cut into this so we can try it out. Okay, this, this really smells good and it's time to try it out. Uh, I really want to put some mushroom ketchup on it right away, but I'm going to wait because I want to see what this really tastes like before I put the wonderful mushroom ketchup on it. That's a tremendous mix of flavors. Excellent. The beef, perfectly tender, wonderful. Puff paste, you can't go wrong. And that onion flavor in there, along with the spices. And I did not put too much pepper, don't worry. You can always put a little bit more on, but that, it's a perfect medley of flavors. Amazing. Now let's try it with the mushroom ketchup. I know this is really gonna set it off. Hmm. Wow. That little bit of kind of vinegar taste and the extra salt and the mushroom flavor to die for. I think I wanted Instead of the water, I should have just dumped mushroom ketchup in right on top before I cooked it. This would be a tremendous thing to cook at an event. Everyone will love you, so you should try this one out. 
The flavors are tremendous. It's not difficult to do. There aren't even that many ingredients. So definitely try this one out. I want to thank you for coming along as we try these things out, as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. We're concluding our baking in the Dutch oven series with this wonderful little fruit tart. I think you're going to be surprised with this one. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. Our recipe today comes from Maria Rundell's 1808 cookbook, A New System of Domestic Cookery. This is a recipe for a minced pie, but it's a little different. It's got a different twist on it. It's a lemon mince pie. Let's get started. Today we're baking this in one of our eight inch tart tins. These guys are hand made by Dennis Cooch, one of our tinsmiths. He does a wonderful job. They're available uh, in, the, on the print, in the print catalog and on our website. The original recipe actually calls for making this in patty pans. And probably the closest thing you've got in a modern kitchen is a cupcake tin. So this is actually meant to be small individual little pies or tarts. Today we're making this in one of these tart tins because of course we're going to be baking in a Dutch oven. If you're going to be using one of these 18th century style tart tins, the bottom doesn't come out of this so you want to make sure to butter it really, really well or you'll never be able to get it out of the tin. This tart tin's already well buttered. We can just lay in our paste in the bottom and a short paste, any paste will work fine here. A short paste will work great. And if you're interested in a short paste recipe, uh, I'll put a link to our short paste episode down in the description section below. Our first ingredient is lemon peel. And you might immediately say, well, wait a minute, John, did they have lemons in the 18th century? Uh, obviously you see lemons all over in the cookbooks. Um, it really depends on where you're located and the economic level of the person as to how common lemons would be in their standard daily diet. But obviously they're very popular in the cookbooks. Um, in this particular setting, we're gonna be using lemons. Um, what we're gonna do is we need a uh, lemon peel. And you can just peel off the peel of your lemon, cut it off in one nice long strip. It'll make it easier to work with. And boil your lemon peel about 20 minutes. This is gonna get rid of some of the bitterness and make it lots, much easier to work with. Uh, once we've boiled this lemon peel, we can take it out and mince it nice and fine. To mix this up, we need a, a re non-reactive bowl, something like a ceramic bowl or a wooden bowl. Uh, inside this, we've got one large apple chopped up. Uh, it's been pared and cored and chopped rather finely. You'll want to use some baking kind of apple. A Golden Delicious might work well in this. That's what we're using right now. To this, we're going to add the diced uh, lemon peel that I talked about earlier, a quarter of a cup of suet, a quarter of a cup of sugar, the juice of one to two lemons, and a half a cup of raisins. Mix these up well. We are using suet in this recipe. It can be difficult to find. We do sell a uh, USDA approved suet in, at our, in our catalog and on our website. You may be able to find some kinds of suet in your local supermarket or at your butcher shop. Uh, again, if you're interested in suet, I wanna point you to an earlier episode we did on rendering your own suet. We need to cook this at around 400 degrees, so we'll need to get this Dutch oven nice and hot before we put this in and make sure it's got plenty of coals. It's going to bake probably 20 minutes or so. And there we go. It is, this one's definitely cool enough to handle. If we wanted this to really set up so that we might be able to get it completely out of the pan, you'll wanna let this cool overnight. Maybe even in the refrigerator or someplace really cool to let it really solidify. Uh, because it's gonna be hard to get out of this tart tin. Some of those juices have boiled up out of it and come down the edges. So it's gonna be hard to get out. I'm just gonna take a slice out of this guy because there's no way at this kind of temperature that it's gonna come out whole. Let's give this a try. That's got an amazing punch to it. This is wonderful. 
I can see why they call it a lemon mince pie. It's got a wonderful lemony flavor to it. That lemon peel and the lemon juice really come through, and yet you get these other chunks, uh, sort of, I guess, the meat of the tart, uh, which is the apple and the raisin, which give you wonderful sweetness, but the flavor that really comes through is the lemon. So this concludes our Dutch oven series. On a wonderful note, this would make a definitely a wonderful dessert. If you're in the field, you wanna do a simple one, excellent. You can make the crust right there. Uh, none of these things need to be refrigerated, so you can definitely do this in the field. So wonderful. If you get a chance, you can try this at home. Again, wonderful dessert dish. Definitely give this one a try. I want to thank you for coming along while we experiment with these Dutch ovens. While we, while we see exactly what you can do in a Dutch oven in the field. Amazing things, wonderful dishes, great. I want to thank you for coming along as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Today we're going to be making a wonderful traditional pound cake. This recipe comes from Amelia Simmons' 1796 cookbook, American Cookery. It's a simple recipe that I think you're going to find a little surprising. The term pound cake today uh, generally refers to a cake that's uh, baked in a, a round form pan, like a bunt pan, and they're generally much more dense than, uh, say, a typical cake. In the 18th century, however, the term pound cake really comes from the amount of uh, ingredients that are in this recipe. So generally a pound of butter, a pound of sugar, a pound of flour, and a pound of eggs. And in Amelia Simmons's recipe, that's exactly what we've got. Amelia also suggests a, a couple of other things, a gill of rose water and spices to taste. So Amelia Simmons's recipe is it's too simple. It's only got just a, a few lines, really, to put together this seemingly complex cake. I mean, we might be tempted to just throw the ingredients together, mix them up, and toss it in the oven. But uh, if you study other 18th century cake recipes from a, maybe a slightly earlier time period and books that have a little more information, we find out that we can't do that with this recipe. We actually have to use these other techniques from other cookbooks to make this properly. We need to start with creaming our butter with our sugar. Now this butter has been softened but not melted. Now in the 18th century they would have mixed this by squeezing it together with their hands. You can speed this process up by using a modern mixer on high for about five minutes. When it comes to spices, Amelia gives us basically no suggestions. She leaves this completely up to the cook. Now, many uh, recipes in the 18th century would use something like caraway seeds. That's uh, very popular for something like this. Um, but today we're going to be using some nutmeg and a little bit of cinnamon, both uh, also very popular uh, 18th century spices for this kind of a, a cake. Now that this is light and fluffy, we can add in our spices. I've got about a half a nutmeg here that's grated up and maybe a teaspoon or a little bit less of nice ground cinnamon. And if you're going to be trying the rose water, now would be the time to add that in. And then we're gonna mix this up for another minute or two. So let's talk a little bit first about rose water. And rose water is used in this, or she mentions rose water in this recipe. Rose water was very popular in the 17th century, early 18th century in cooking. And we kind of think of it as a spice, but really it's more of an aromatic, a, a perfume that we use in these recipes. Another aromatic that's very popular is the orange blossom water. And you'll, you can find either one of these still available in uh, either online or in Mediterranean markets. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, by the end of the 1700s, these things were really falling out of favor in English cooking. We tried this recipe out a number of times with the rose water. And uh, we, we tried this on different people. And some people really thought the flavor was intriguing. And others disliked it because it reminded them the, the flavor of soap. If you're looking for that kind of traditional taste, um, I, I suggest you go ahead and try to find some, some uh, rose water or orange flower blossom water to, to experiment in this. Uh, 
If you can't find those, it's okay to leave them out. Most modern cakes today use a chemical leavening to make them light and fluffy, either baking soda or baking powder. In the 17th and 18th century, cakes uh, most often used either a yeast leavener or an egg leavening. In other videos, we pointed out that Amelia Simmons uses a very crude version of a chemical leavening in some of her recipes. In other recipes, she uses yeast as a leavener. In this recipe, she doesn't mention any leavening at all. But we have lots of eggs. So what we need to do here is a beat a lot of air into these eggs. As it cooks, these air bubbles will expand that's going to give us our leavening. If you wish to make this recipe as they did in the 1700s, you'll need to whisk this for about an hour, handheld, with a whisk. Uh, if you're going to be using a modern appliance, then you'll need to whisk this on high for not more than 15 minutes. If you're using medium eggs, you'll need 10 eggs. If you're using large eggs, just nine will do. Before you start to whisk these eggs, make sure your whisk is butter-free or the eggs will not whip up properly. Carefully fold the eggs into your butter mixture and then sift in the flour a little by little. Try not to overwork this. We're trying to keep as much of the air in the eggs as possible. Now you can bake this in a bump pan if you'd like. You'll need to butter it very well and you'll bake it at about 325 degrees for say an hour and a half to two hours. Other recipes we found used a cake ring, either a tin cake ring or a wood cake ring that was lined outside with paper and the inside buttered. But Amelia Simmons' recipe suggests baking this for just 15 minutes. Now this gives us another clue into how this version was made. The word cake in the 1700s could apply to a great cake. And we covered something like a great cake when we did our 12th night cake recipe. Now these cakes were huge. Sometimes they were 20, 30, 40 pounds or more. But the word cake can also refer to something much smaller, something that we today would call a cookie. And in fact, the first kind of reference in at least American cookery and English cookery is Amelia Simmons's reference to the word cookie here that she borrows from the Dutch. So if we take into account this 15 minute cooking time, there is no way that this could be baked as a big cake in a bunt pan or in one of these wooden forms. This most, most likely was baked as a cookie on a baking sheet, probably on paper. Uh, they might have baked them in small, say little tart tins that were buttered or even in a little paper uh, tray or cup that we've seen uh, some references to in 18th century cookery. We won't need to butter the paper or treat it in any way. Once these uh, cookies cool all the way off, we'll be able to just peel the paper away. If you're baking these at home, they'll bake for 15 to 20 minutes at a temperature of about 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Make sure to preheat your oven. You'll need to watch these closely so they don't burn. Let them cool completely before you try to remove them from the paper. Let's give these a try. They, they look wonderful. It's uh, actually got a really nice soft texture to it. We have a wonderful simple yet complex flavor to them nice and sweet again really really good texture nice nice and soft you can definitely taste the nutmeg and the cinnamon in there uh, it would be really interesting to have these with a little bit of that rose water these are wonderful and really simple and can you imagine if you baked four pounds of these guys it's likely that you either had a really big crowd to feed or you would double bake these to dry them up so that they would last for quite a while. And let's look at one of these little these uh, little bigger ones, this cupcake version here. And I can break this open here and you can see the texture. It's got a really nice cakey texture to it. This is not dense at all. It really, all that air whipped in there did a, a tremendous job of leavening this. It's really good. Mmm. Today's recipe is a wonderful savory onion pie. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. So today's recipe comes from the little primitive cookery cookbook. 
This cookbook is sort of a compilation of uh, 18th century recipes that this, this particular 18th century author put together for people of lesser means. And this onion pie is probably sort of a substitute for a meat pie. It's a savory pie. You'll find this recipe in Hannah Glass's cookbook and in some other 18th century English cookbooks. So it's a, it's a really interesting, fun recipe. Let's get started. This recipe is very simple. We need an equal quantity of potatoes, apples, onions, and boiled eggs sliced up. So let's get started. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pair up uh, some potatoes here. You wanna pair them up fairly thinly and so that you have nice thin slices. And then we can move on to some apples. You'll need, again, maybe two or three apples, just like the potatoes. First, we're gonna pair them and then core them and now slice them nice and thin. Next up, onions. I mean, this is an onion pie, right? Again, about the same quantity. So if your onions are a little bit smaller, you might need three or four. And you'll want to, of course, uh, take the outer layer off of these and slice them up nice and thin. Again, probably about an eighth of an inch, maybe a quarter inch max. And our last main ingredient here is boiled eggs. I boiled these up last night. Let's peel them up. And now I'm gonna kind of slice them. They, they're fighting me, uh, but even crumbled up, they're gonna, they're gonna work just fine. Again, about the same amount. Now let's put together a quick spice mix that we'll need as we're assembling this. Uh, first, we have some salt, maybe a teaspoon or two, ground pepper. We want some mace in this. So I've got some mace here. And of course, we need in every recipe, nutmeg, half a teaspoon of nutmeg total. And now I'm just gonna stir these up. Now we're ready to assemble this. We have all the ingredients set up and I've already got a, a short crust put into this redware pie pan. You'll need to make sure to have a pie crust ready. Uh, if you are interested in this pie crust, you can go and check out the episode we did, I think back in the third season. I'll put a link down in the description section. Let's assemble this pie. It's really simple. First, we're gonna start off with a little bit of butter in the bottom. The uh, recipe calls for just a couple little chunks here in the bottom, and now let's put a layer of uh, potatoes in the very bottom of our pie. The recipe also calls for, as you're putting these stages together, to put in a little bit of spices in each layer. Now we're gonna go with some apple here. Again, with just a little bit of seasoning, it's good. Now we're gonna come in with some onion on top here. And now let's put in some of the egg. Now the instructions say to keep going with the layers. Now, depending on how thick your pie is, you may not have enough room for another layer, but I'm gonna do a thin layer. Now, if you uh, look at this recipe here toward the end, it says you're gonna end up using about a pound of potatoes, a pound of apples, a pound of onions, and a pound of eggs. That means this whole pie is gonna weigh well, more than four pounds. It's a huge pie, at least in the recipe. This pie and this pie plate is much smaller, so you won't need a full pound. Um, obviously, this is, it's gonna fill this pie right up though. It's gonna be sort of heaping, but that's okay. It's gonna cook down a little bit. We're gonna finish this pie up now by placing some chunks of butter up on top and um, a little bit of water two, maybe two or three teaspoons. It calls for adding a little bit of water in here. We wanna, we're sort of steaming, what's uh, steaming the ingredients in this pie. And let's put this top crust on and let's pinch this together and, and get this connected. So it's connected to the bottom crust. Now that we've finished that up, we can just put three little slices in the tops of this vents a little bit. We don't want it to sort of bulge up with the, uh, with the steam pressure on the inside. And here's our assembled pie. It's ready to go in the oven. Uh, if you're doing it in a standard oven in a modern kitchen, I would set the oven at about 350 degrees. And this guy's gonna take at least 45 minutes, probably more like an hour to bake. Wow, this pie smells great. Let's cut into it and see what it looks like. Hmm, wow. That is really, really good. Mm. It's got a wonderful mix of flavors and spices. 
and it's so wonderful and savory and moist still. I mean, with all that butter in there, you know it's good. This is a great kind of full meal pie. Like, you wouldn't need to have a meat course if you had a pie like this that you were, you were serving with maybe just one little side dish or something. It's a wonderful uh, main dish. Uh, if you get a chance at all, and this is such an inexpensive, quick and easy uh, pie to make up. It only takes an hour or so to bake, and it, the flavors are amazing. So definitely give this one a try. You'll love it. The kids will like it. it even a little bit of mushroom ketchup on top of this, whew, it set it off perfectly. I want to thank you so much for joining me today as we come along and savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Today we are going to make a recipe called Tiny Purses. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. This recipe comes from a 1596 cookbook called The Good Housewife's Jewel. Mm -hmm. This recipe, although it's called Little Purses, is really a date turnover. The first thing we have to do is stone these dates. I've got about two cupfuls of dates here. Ooh, this is sticky. Although, if you want to save time, you can buy your dates pre-stoned. Now that we've stoned our dates, let's mix our ingredients. First, we need our dates. Then, we need a cupful of small raisins. I'm using Zante currants. The recipe calls for marrow. I'm going to use a tablespoon of suet instead. A good substitute might be coconut oil. We're also going to season it with a teaspoon of ginger, a teaspoon of cinnamon, and two teaspoons of sugar. Now that we've got all the ingredients, let's mix it into the bowl. Ooh, this is really sticky stuff. You really gotta dig into this. Now that our mixture is ready, let's put them in the shells. The shells are going to be puff paste, cut into about five inch squares. If you're interested in making your own puff paste, I'll put a link down below. Lay down your paste and put a flattened portion of the filling. Make sure it's decent sized and flattened. Moisten two of the edges and fold it into a triangle. Make sure to pinch the edges. These are ready to bake at about 350 degrees. I'm not sure how long these take, but I'll watch them till they're golden brown. These smell great. It's so good, in fact, that I asked my dad to come and taste test with me. Well, they do smell great. I could smell them in the oven, and uh, wow, they, they filled the house up with a wonderful smell. So, are we gonna try them out? I think they're, they're, they're cool enough, so let's give them a try. You pick one. I'll take this one. They look beautiful, too. They could even have icing on them, but I think that would be too much. Mmm. That is a wonderful flavor. I really wasn't expecting that. I ate a few of the dates that she had raw, and the dates were actually obviously very good, but with the spices they that taste are- They wonderful. Right, with that ginger and the cinnamon in there with the dates and the, and the, uh, and the raisins or the currants, it's got an amazing flavor that I really wasn't expecting and a wonderful aroma. Yes. You did an excellent job on these. They, they look kind of really hard to, to smoosh up. They are. Yeah, they're, it's a very sticky, uh, the dates and everything, getting that all together. But I did a great job. Thank you for bringing us this recipe. It was wonderful. Uh, if you get a chance, this one, again, it's simple. Uh, really not that many ingredients and all these things you can find uh, at the grocery store. So you should be able to do these easily. So thank you so much, Ivy. And I want to thank you for coming along and savoring the flavors and the aromas of, of the, the 18th, 18th century. century. So Ivy and I today are working on a recipe. It's called to make black caps. Turns out to be baked apples. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. This recipe comes from the Dictionarium Domesticum, 1736, and it's Nathan Bailey. Uh, but this recipe shows up again in other recipe books, it, uh, all the way up until like 1800 and Hannah Glass is um, 
uh, confectionaries, complete confectionery. So, uh, and you'll find this recipe in variations in other 18th century cookbooks. But it's, you know, it's pretty simple and they're all very similar recipes. How do you get started? Well, uh, let's start off by, well, I'll tell you what, we're gonna need sugar for later on in this recipe. So why don't you work at getting some sugar off of this sugar cone and bust it into this bowl. And I will start working on these apples. What we need to do is split these apples in half uh, and take out the core. So the recipe calls for baking these in a mazarine dish. What's a mazarine dish? A mazarine dish in the time period was a metal baking dish with the sides that were turned up. Uh, instead of using that, I'm gonna use, because I don't have one quite like that, um, I'm gonna use a tart tin. Uh, what we need, well, the thing is, we're going to have liquids in here, and we need it to uh, not run over the edge. So you couldn't use, just use a flat baking sheet. You need something that'll hold the liquids in. Uh, this baking sheet won't hold uh, nearly as many as they called for. So uh, I've just got three apples here. But you need to put them face down uh, on the on the baking sheet here. It says to fit these in tightly into the space. So our apples are ready. Now we need to make a little sauce to pour over them. It's a very simple little sauce. It's made with lemon juice. To that, we're going to add some orange flower water. Now the original recipe calls for actually a good bit of orange flower water. It, it tends to be overpowering and it's not that easy to find. I've got some orange flower water here. I'm just gonna use say maybe a tablespoon um, but you, you could probably do without it altogether. And the zest from just one lemon, and what have we got here? About maybe two tablespoons of sugar that we'll add to this also. Now let's just stir this up and pour it over the top of our apples. If you're doing a larger quantity, you might need more of this sauce. So the recipe does not have any real like amount of ingredients here. We don't know exactly how much um, lemon juice or how much orange flower water. So we're just kind of, you know, taking a guess at this. Um, the sauce we made, we mixed it all together, but really the sugar is supposed to go on last. So it kind of sticks on top of these. So you might, once you've drizzled this on, try to, to sprinkle a little sugar up on top of the apples. It may or may not stick. So this is basically ready to go in the oven. How long does this take? Uh, it should bake a half an hour, the recipe says, and it says a quick oven, which probably means, let's say 400 degrees is probably a good a guess. So let's try these out at 400 degrees for a half hour. These smell wonderful. Why don't we try them out? Well, we could eat these right now as they are, but they're called black caps for a reason. We aren't done yet. We need to brown these on top. So they might have put these in the oven a little bit longer, made sure there was sugar up on top. Uh, but some of the other recipes actually call for coming in and using a salamander to brown them up on top. So that's what we're going to do. We're gonna use a, or either a fire shovel or a salamander. And we're gonna try uh, getting these to brown up or blacken. Salamanders would have been heated until red hot in the fire. Today in a modern kitchen, you could use your broiler, but you wanna make sure to watch it closely. You can serve these up in little individual bowls and pour in a little bit of cream and they're ready to go to the table. These look and smell great. What do you think, Ivy? Let's give them a try. Mmm. Wow. Wow. That is, whoa, the lemon juice. That is good. And the uh, orange flower water. And really the orange flower water comes in here. Really, it's more of a top note, a, 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 a scent, a fragrance that, they, that it gives it. So what do you think, Ivy? I love the flavors and it was so easy. Yeah, a very simple recipe, some wonderful flavors. Um, you gotta give this one a try. It's, it's very, it's so simple and it's easy and it only takes a little while to bake. Uh, inexpensive ingredients. It is a great one. So give this one a try. I wanna thank you for coming along as we savor the flavors and the aromas of, of the 18th, 18th century. century. 
Today is a fun and kind of a different episode. I'm out here in the woods today and we're going to be doing a very simple Norfolk dumplings recipe. This one's from the Primitive Cookery Cookbook, but you also found it in Hannah Glass's cookbook of, say, 1747. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking. Well, I've got water on to boil. Let me read you this very simple recipe in this little cookbook. It says, to make Norfolk dumplings, mix a good thick batter as for pancakes. Take a half a pint of milk, two eggs, a little salt, make it into a batter with flour. Have ready a clean saucepan of water boiling into which you drop the batter before the water boils fast. Um, and two or three minutes will boil them. Stir a piece of butter into them and eat them hot while they're very good. This is a super simple recipe. It uses just uh, flour, a little bit of salt, milk, one egg. We want to make it a really thick batter. We don't want it to break up as we put it into this boiling water. It's going to take a good bit for this water to get boiled. The other trick with this recipe, if you're on the trail and you don't have some of these special ingredients, you don't have eggs with you, which is very, very common that you wouldn't have eggs. Uh, milk is something you're, you're not going to have on the trail. The question is, would this work out just as fine if we didn't have uh, milk or eggs, but we just used water and flour? I'm betting that's going to work out just fine too. That's probably going to be the most common version that you would do on the trail or in the camp when you don't have lots of ingredients to work with. And I've got just the simplest of mixing utensils here. I've got a little wire fork and just one simple wooden spoon along with a mixing bowl. Just the minimal equipment is what we're going with here. And of course, I've got one of our tin cooking pots to cook our dumplings in. Let's start off with just one egg here and uh, whisk this up. To this egg, I'm going to add, let's say, about a cup of milk. Uh, I'm going to hold a little back here in case uh, the mix is a little too thick later on. Now, let's add some flour into this mix. And we're going to add enough flour that we think we're going to get to a thick batter. Of course, she doesn't say anything about how much flour. You just add as much as gets to the right consistency. And don't forget to add a little bit of salt before you get this fully mixed up. Maybe a little thicker than I would consider a, a uh, pancake mix, but still uh, a batter, not a dough necessarily. Well, my fire has built up nicely and it's just starting to boil. So let's put some of these dumplings in by the spoonful. There we go. I'm not sure exactly what Hannah Glass intended when she put this very simple recipe in her cookbook. But the author or the collector of recipes for primitive cookery saw this recipe and knew that it was perfect for simple cooking, for inexpensive cooking. And that's why they picked it out and put it into this little cookbook. It's sort of a compilation of simple, inexpensive recipes. There we go. They're ready. They've been in probably a little bit longer than the two or three minutes, but I didn't have a really, you know, hot boiling thing going on here. So let's take a look. So let's see how these turn out. They look pretty simple and they are obviously just a few ingredients, but they have a wonderful little, uh, kind of a little bready consistency. Um, obviously they've got, I mean, they're a little bland because they're just not amazing flavors and there are there. We haven't put a lot of ingredients in there, but it's got a wonderful texture and this would go great in something like, a, you know, a stew or a soup that you make on the trail, especially a super simple one on the trail. We can't expect amazing, intense, you know, flavors. Oh, get, this is the best thing I've ever had. Sometimes when you're really tired and you're cold. And, uh, you, you know, you've just built a fire like this and, and you've walked a long way. You carried what you've got with you. This is an amazing meal because you've made it yourself and you've brought all the things along with you. And there's just a very, very few ingredients. I really want to encourage you to get out this spring, get outdoors, uh, get cooking some of these amazing, simple things. They are incredible. This is such a wonderful time of year to get out and to get active and to really kind of 
you know, get into the groove again of summer. I want to thank you for joining along with me today in this experiment as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century.